Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Steele from Fresh Eggs Daily and I am really excited about today. Um, for those of you joining us, we are holding a virtual progressive dinner, which I think is going to be super fun. So for those of you who don't know what a progressive dinner is, I think they were popular in the 50s or 60s and couples would get together and they would start off at one house and have cocktails or an appetizer, then they'd move to the next house for you know, maybe a salad, then they'd have the entree at the next house and the dessert at the last house. So that way one host wasn't responsible for the whole dinner, sort of like a bar crawl, but with food. So um, for those of you who follow me, you probably know that I'm working on a cookbook for Harper Horizon, which is a division of Harper Collins. It's coming out next February. I've always been kind of a closet foodie, um, but this last year I've really gotten more involved in the culinary world and I mean, who isn't doing more cooking at home? And I had the idea that it would be fun to do a progressive dinner virtually. So I asked some of my favorite cookbook authors if they would like to join me and they did. So today is the day. Um, so I'm supposed to be just wasting a couple minutes for some more people to come on. Um, but that's what we're gonna do. So we are going to start off with a charcuterie board. Then we're gonna move into a cocktail, which if you check my feed, scroll back a couple to the announcement about the dinner and swipe across, there are the ingredients you need so you can make the cocktail right along with us. Then we're going to have a main course, a salad, and end with a dessert. The, the dessert ingredients are also um, listed on that one post. And we are giving away a set of cookbooks. So make sure that you, again, go back to the post that announces the dinner, sign up, tag some friends, sign up to win the cookbooks, and also be sure that you follow all of the hosts. They are all in my stories. They're on my feed and as each host joins you'll be able to see and follow them because they're all really awesome they're really great cooks they all have really great cookbooks out and this should be a lot of fun so we'll see <laughs> i hope the technology works um anyway uh, i still got a couple more minutes i'm supposed to be wasting to let a couple more people join in but um I guess it doesn't make sense to tell you who they are because it'll be hard to find them and tag them. Um, so I guess we'll just go one by one as they come on. I am going to uh, get started with Georgia Pellegrini, who is a uh, good friend of mine. We've known each other for a while. And um, I always say that she's kind of the cooler version of me because I'm a total wuss. She um, does some adventure getaways with a bunch of women where they go off and they like hunt and fish and cook things over the fire and all that. Um, and that's, you know, like I said, I'm a wuss, but I feel like, I feel like we clicked because we have something in common. We both started in the finance world and then I started raising chickens. She went to the French Culinary Institute and worked in France for a while. So really we have nothing in common, <laughs> but, um, We've been great friends anyway for a while. Um, so I'm going to add her in. This is interactive, so if you have questions, I'm going to basically just ask, act as the host, and I'll be able to feed questions to whoever is cooking. So feel free just to ask, and we'll try to answer them, and we'll just have a lot of fun. So I'm going to try to figure out how to, oh, add Georgia. There we go. And we should see a split screen in a minute. Um, oh, there she is. Okay. Hi. Great. Hey. Thank you. So as I mentioned, Georgia and I have been friends for a long time. In fact, we uh, had lunch here in Maine over the summer, and um, she's just she's awesome. So Georgia is the author of Modern Pioneering. Um, she's got two other books as well, and she is also hosting Modern Pioneering on American Public American Public Television which just started, uh, I guess, about a month ago, airing, right? Uh, actually, no, last October. So we've been airing, oh, okay. I guess, a good, what, six, nine months now? Yeah, it's been really, really fun to have it out there. Time flies. <laughs> anyway, it's a great show. I love this book. As you can see, I have my own copy. The Watermelon Keg is one of my personal <laughs> favorites. Also, the um, Ice Cubes with edible flowers in them. So, like I said, we, we're like soul sisters, but she's, like, way cooler than I am. So... <laughs> Um, she today 
is there anything else I should say about you? I have my little notes. Um, host, you know, blah, 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 French. You can ask me as you go, too. Do you think of anything? Yeah, if, of yeah and it really, if anybody has any <laughs> questions, I'll try to keep an eye on the questions. Georgia used to live in New York City, um, and it kind of bums me out that she moved because she was, like, my source of where to eat whenever I'm in Manhattan. <laughs> but she lives in Austin now, which is cool also. Uh, another foodie scene. So Georgia is going to make us a charcuterie board. So this is my attempt, which is really sad. Wow. A lot of That's good, Lisa. No, a lot of times in the summer, especially this past year, we would have a happy hour, and then it sort of would be dinner time, and I didn't feel like making dinner, so I'd just throw a bunch of stuff on a cutting board and be like, well, here's dinner, and let's just keep drinking. But I don't really know how to, how to make a board, like how to make it look pretty. Obviously, there's an art to it, so why don't you go ahead and get us started with this dinner? All right, here we go. So the trick about charcuterie boards is to make them fun and whimsical. I'm gonna move my camera down a little bit so you can kind of see what I've got going on. But I actually took the entire table and I made it into one big charcuterie board. And for me, I feel like what's fun about charcuterie boards is you can get really creative, but it can also be very interactive. There's lots of color and texture and, and you know, sort of one of my, one of the things that I think is important about the components of a charcuterie board is that you have a little bit of sweet, a little bit of salty, a little bit of sour, and a lot of different textures. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna sort of take you step by step through what I've included and why, and hopefully it gives you some, some tips on sort of techniques for building a charcuterie board. Perfect. So to start, I'm gonna kind of have you head over so you can see exactly what we got. So I took a piece of butcher paper. It's like a freezer wrap. And this is a fun white color. You can also get it in sort of craft paper. And what I did was I created um, a series of flavors here. I've got some sort of sweet cherry peppers. And with that, I've got a truffle mousse, which you can spread on some crackers. And then I've got some local honey. So you've got sort of like a a musty sort of creamy texture. You've got the sweet from the honey and the sour from the peppers. And then I always love to, I always love to tell people what they're eating so there's not some giant question. So if you can see here, I've got this, I started to label each meat. And I kind of let the other stuff be a little bit, you know, self-explanatory, but I love to explain the meats because with charcuterie, you know, there's always sort of a sense of, you know, what is this weird dried meat that I'm eating? <laughs> <laughs> or cheeses too, I guess. It would be good to label cheeses because they all kind of look the same. I love that you wrote right on the paper. That's so yeah. cool. And that's what's great about this is you can make one big mess and then you can just, right. you know, gather it up at the end of the day and toss it in the, in the, in the recycling or the trash. And, um, you know, it's just sort of about creating some whimsy and some color and some texture. So over here, I've got, you can see here, I've got some mustard. If people want to add that, I've got um, one of my favorite things, which are radishes. Radishes have a wonderful sort of peppery texture and a great crunch. Um, and the pepperiness is so nice to sort of complement the sweet and the sour. What I love about radishes though, is I always add really good quality butter and then a little bit of, of coarse sea salt, like a Malden sea salt. I just think it's, you know, buttered radishes are sort of a fun, you see that a lot in French restaurants and and things like that. But I just think they're such a fun, beautiful thing. And you want to make sure you trim your radishes, um, kind of take the, the tips off the bottom, clean them up a little bit, make them look nice and, and appealing. Um, before you <laughs> Not like you just pulled it out of the dirt and stuck it on the <laughs> table. <laughs> right. And then here I've got um, some copa, which is, um, which I love. It's sort of got this beautiful kind of laced fat throughout. It's a, it's a, um, a pork product. And I've got some sweet here. Figs, I think, are just a must for charcuterie. I love figs. You know, they have that sort of honey, honey quality and that sort of, you know, earthiness and that sweetness that, that goes so well with the saltiness from the copa. Um, so I love to think about things in terms of not just texture and flavors, but also height and layers. And I always try to think about the law of threes when I'm, when I'm cooking. And, and I, it's actually something I learned, I think from Thomas Keller one time, actually, I think in culinary school way back, where people have a, there's sort of a, a visual and, and psychological pleasure people get around the idea of um, cooking with uh, around threes and they see threes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're not, not going to be perfect, but, you know, when you set things out, think about trying to do it in odd numbers at the very least. Um, it gives people sort of a, you know, because food is about all of the senses, right? It's about 
taste. It's about the visual stimulation. It's about the smells and the, and the textures. So you have to kind of enliven all of the senses whenever you can. So I just want to note here, I have four olives. Uh -oh. And I have four olives, Better and I have one. four slices of this, and I have two of those. So rule of threes is good. I'll know for next time. I love it. Okay, and here I've got some um, pickled carrots, which I actually managed to salvage from my garden right before the big Texas freeze. And I just think, once again, it's a fun color. You want to think about different colors on your charcuterie. Think about texture. That's sour, once again. And then I've got some delicious Marcona almonds, which... Who doesn't love a, a delicious almond on a charcuterie board? And that has some nice salts to it, which I think, um, you know, is another nice thing. You want to get that punch. And they're sort of tossed with a little bit of olive oil, which is nice. Here I've got calabrese, which is a wonderful sort of pepperoni. Then I've got my grapes. And I've got my antlers here as a sort of display. But you can use so many different things, right? You can use, you know, you don't, you don't, have, a, you don't have a shed antler available to you. You can go outside and get a branch if you want to. That's true. The forest and you know, give it a good rinse and, and use that as sort of a fun way to hang things off of to create a bit of whimsy. Um, and then I've got my little cornichons. I live for a good cornichon. These little tiny pickles, they're the best. Mm -hmm. Perfect crunch and that salt, so good. Over here, I've got speck, which hopefully you can see. It's a nice oh yeah, I have some of that too. Oh, there you go, yeah. It's a wonderful <laughs> dry cured Ham. It's very similar to the prosciutto. Right. I've got Spanish olives, which I adore. They have that wonderful fresh, fresh flavor. They're not too briny. And they, they're just a great way to kind of give you a little extra brine and fresh flavor. Here I've got some charred artichokes. And then over here is one of my favorite things. It's called finocchiona. It's, um, it's a pork sausage, and it's got fennel seeds in it. And I always like to try to oh, cut some slices for people mm -hmm. so that it's sort of ready to go and they don't have to sit here and saw away at the, at the charcuterie. Um, so try to cut a few slices if you can for them in advance. This one over here is also wonderful. It's, I actually learned about this in my first book, Food Heroes, um, from an amazing sausage maker. It's called Cacciaturini. If you can see close. Cacciaturini, it's a wild boar sausage. And it's just got this wonderful flavor. And I think it's traditionally considered a hunter's sausage in Italy. And um, people just take it on picnics. And it's just, it's just mm. fabulous. So you can find that at your store. I recommend it. And then I just got some pickled okra here. And, you know, once again, a little color, a little texture, a little, you know, it's all about balancing out those flavors and, you know, allowing people to sort of have fun and interact and, I think this, but I think in general, when you're hosting an event or, or having a good charcuterie, it's about allowing people to sort of um, make it a conversational element as well. So yeah, I love it. It's like a little grouping. I'm going to put down my big charcuterie board here. How's I love how the groupings are almost like a little recipe almost. You know, yeah, like it's they, it's like they're sort of like a buffet. It's like creating art mm -hmm. on the table. And I think, you know, I think. It's sort of, it's, I feel like at the end of the day, um, dinner parties are, are theater, you know? And I think um, you're creating a sort of experience for people that's not just, um, not just about the culinary experience, but about, you know, the whole interactive experience as well, so. No, I agree. And you actually, you don't have any cheese on that board. I don't. So I'm actually a big fan of separating the two out. I, I think it's sort of like you're doing your meats or you're doing your cheeses. Or if you wanted to go in the direction of like a smoked salmon, you could kind of play in that direction. But I, I'm a big fan of kind of se keeping them separate. Um, I just think that it's just sort of my style. We really get to celebrate one or the other. No, I love that. These were all really great tips that looks absolutely beautiful. And I'm just going to like munch on my board because it looks really <laughs> lame. But it's well, delicious anyway. Right. Now, it's just the exciting part. <laughs> I, I know. Sit down and chow down <laughs> and watch the rest of you ladies cook while I eat. Awesome. Yeah, it's time to actually make a cocktail. So everyone go follow Georgia Pellegrini and look for her book, Modern Pioneering. Sign up for the giveaway and stick around because we are making a drink next. Thanks, Georgia. Sure, my pleasure. All right, I don't actually know how to get rid of Georgia now. Maybe I just X myself out. There you go. Okay. Mm. 
All right. So I just, okay. I just invited Natalie from Beautiful Hi. Boo. Hello. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I am great. This is Natalie's book, Beautiful Booze, um, and I have to tell you, it, it's, uh, it is beautiful. I mean, it, it's just, it's a really pretty book, and she's going to teach us how to make a cocktail, and I just want to see my notes. She actually considers herself a cocktailian. Is that correct? <laughs> well, I, you know, I started this. I've never been a bartender at all, uh, strictly self-taught myself at home. So I guess a home bartender um, would also be appropriate. And you also left like the real working world to kind of pursue your passion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I worked for the government for like 10 years. And so, um, I mean, it's really opposite. I worked in public health and then I started taking photos of cocktails and creating fun recipes with stuff that I already have at home. And I think during the time of COVID now, people are really looking for, you know, those easy cocktails to whip up really fast at home since we're not really going out to bars right now. Yeah, absolutely. I know, like I said, we often have happy hours that just turn into dinner. So, <laughs> um, all right. So I actually, uh, some of the ingredients, if anybody watching has the ingredients, we did post them beforehand, but tell us what we're going to make and walk me through it. Yeah. So this cocktail is in the book and before COVID, I actually lived out of my suitcase for five years. So I got a lot of inspiration for these recipes by traveling to different places. And so this is something, I mean, in the book, it's called enjoying a margarita in, in Venetia. So enjoying a margarita in Venice, but it's just the simplistic term for it is an Aperol margarita. I wanted to take two of my favorite cocktails and kind of combine the best elements together to make it into one. So the Aperol Spritz, um, which is very famous in Italy, Aperitivo Hour, I think in the U.S. it's getting more and more popular. And then the Margarita, which is going to feature tequila from Mexico. So combining both of those <laughs> cocktails together, classic cocktails together to make one. So um, Love it. Yeah, so here, if you guys were following along, you know the ingredients. It's pretty easy. We're doing tequila, Aperol, um, some lime juice, some orange juice, and then also some agave syrup. And one tip that I wanted to talk about, a lot of people will use the uh, agave syrup in cocktails, but all the brands are kind of cr not created equally. Some are sweeter than others, more rich. So you kind of want to do it to taste. So, okay. you know, if you don't want your cocktail to be that sweet, you might not want to add the full half ounce. You might just want to kind of test it out to get that great formula. So for this, so I have to actually admit, I, I read the ingredients this morning, did not have any agave. So I made my own simple syrup. So, okay, I mean, yeah. Same deal, you know. <laughs> yeah, for these recipes are super adaptable. You could use, I've used a honey syrup in this, which mm -hmm. you're just going to do equal parts honey and hot water. You can even make it in a coffee cup. Just take the hot water, stir up the honey. And then with the simple syrup, you're doing equal parts sugar, water is how I make it. So any sweetener that you like, you might Perfect. not need a ton of it. So we're okay. using, the first thing we're going to use is a shaker um, and you can use like a jar. You don't necessarily have to have a shaker. If you don't have one at home, you will be fine. And what we're going to do is we're going to start making the cocktail. We're going to go ahead and put one and a half ounces of tequila. And I tell people that really are like, oh, I want it to be really boozy. And I totally appreciate that. But I do think when it comes to cocktails, um, one thing to know is to get a really good balance. You don't want one ingredient overpowering another one. You don't want right. it to be so heavy on the booze that you can't taste the final outcome of the cocktail. So that's why measuring is very important. Then we're going to well, do like you can just have another one. Like if you finish yeah. that one, you can have a second one. You don't need yeah. to have all your alcohol in the first one. Yeah, you <laughs> okay. don't want to limit yourself. And we're going to do <laughs> right. one, one ounce of Aperol. Um, Okay, so again, I read the ingredients this morning, don't have any Aperol, but I was doing a little bit of Googling, and I have uh, Seville orange bitters, and I have Cointreau, like is either a substitute? 
I mean, you could definitely, I think the Quantro is going to be a great substitute for this. Okay. Um, yeah. So you just want to use what you have. I mean, I also have like a banana liqueur over there and several other things that would be really great in this recipe. And honestly, if you don't have the bitter component, you can just leave it out. Okay. If you want. How much you was know that? What I mean? An ounce? One ounce. One yeah. So one ounce. And then for me, my biggest tip um, for cocktails, making them at home is um, I underestimated when I started this, what actually the impact is on making your cocktails with fresh citrus. It just takes your cocktails next level. Just, I mean, it just adds like all the great flavors. And what I do is I just have one of these simple kind of hand pressed yep. juicers that fits to juice your limes and lemons. It's really, you can buy them anywhere. So that's like my biggest tip um, of the day. Yeah, do not, don't buy the real lime or the real lemon yeah. juice. They're yeah. disgusting. I actually buy lemons and limes on sale and I just throw them in the freezer or I'll cut them in half and throw them in the freezer so that I can just defrost them and juice them as I need it. So, yeah, that's yeah. a great way. You can also take that juice and put it into like uh, ice cube molds to have it at mm -hmm. your fingertips. If you oh, good do point. That. So I went ahead and squeezed this before. So we're going to do one ounce of our lime juice. And okay, then yeah, I did too. we're going to do half an ounce of fresh orange juice. And then I have on here, I think, a half an ounce of agave syrup. Um, you might want to start with a fourth of an ounce and just see what you need. Because we did put in um, quite a bit of, of citrus, you might mm -hmm. need to balance that out. But also, um, Aperol does provide a bit of sweetness in it already. So just to, to add that, but I'm going okay. to go ahead and do a half an ounce. I'm using a more mild, mild version of the agave syrup than ones that I've had in the past. So that's pretty much, you know, the recipe. We're combining a little bit of a margarita, a little bit of Aperol spritz time. Oh, and before we get started, also I wanna show you, I'm gonna serve this in a wine glass because I love serving cocktails, oh. not necessarily the traditional glass, but just okay. because an Aperol spritz is sometimes, I think it is served in a wine glass. But what I wanted to show you before you start shaking your cocktail, we're going to go ahead and rim our glass with some salt. And one thing to note is I've done this a million times when I was taking photos of cocktails. I went ahead and poured it and I forgot to put the, yeah. the salt on the rim. So to do that, what I do is just after I've squeezed the lime, I'm just going to kind of roll that lime juice around the top. Okay. Um, of the glass and then we're just going to dip it into salt. Now you can, you can modify this in many ways. You can add say um, chili powder to your salt mixture to add a little spicy vibe if you want to. And now we're gonna go ahead and shake. And one other tip I wanted to give you all really quickly on this is that anything that has like juice in it, you're going to shake anything that doesn't have juice, you're going to stir. So that's the difference between your shaking oh. cocktails like this one and an, like your old fashions and Negronis, you're actually right. going to stir. And oh, also, fine. since this is going to be served on ice, you just need to oh. shake this for about 30 seconds. Okay. Oh, oh, mine's in my, mine's in my lid, so I'm set. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, we done shaking? Yeah. Oh, I love, if you don't, seriously, if you don't have a shaker, you only need to buy one. It makes the drink so cold. It's yeah. like magic. Yeah. And so uh, that's what I wanted to note. You, um, since you are serving this over ice, you don't, and it's going to dilute while you're drinking it, you don't have to shake it up that much. But then we're just going to strain that off. Look at the gorgeous color here. And oh. really quickly, well, you're Mine's not the same color. Like because you didn't use the Aperol. The Aperol oh, okay. is, what, is what's going to okay. burn that color. 
And then I just want to show you all really quick in the book, I did a, a braided citrus garnish. I don't have time to do that today, but I just wanted to tell you, you can invest in one of these. You probably have a potato peeler at home. Oh, yeah. At the dollar store. You're just going to go ahead and peel your citrus like so. And what I'm going to show you really quickly is if you want to add some aromas to cocktails, because just like the cheese board, it's all about visual and aromas with drinks. Um, you can take this piece before you garnish and squeeze it and release oh, the I, oils. I saw, I saw oh, them all. Yeah. Oh. And that's going to, when you take a sip of this, you're going to get all of that great citrus. Now, um, to make the twist, I'm just going to. Oh, that's really good. This this up a little bit with a thing and then you're just going to hold both ends twist towards each other there's your citrus twist pop it in your cocktail and there is our Aperol margarita cheers cheers it's thank you guys so, so much. good oh yummy all right i'm gonna sip this we're gonna move on to our main dish Bye. thank you so much and thank you so much uh, go follow beautiful booze and buy her book All right, I just invited Tara Teaspoon. Um, Tara is actually Hi. a brand new friend. Hi, I actually was fangirling Tara for a little while. Um, so I was so excited when she agreed to do this. She has a brand new book out called Live Life Deliciously. And it I haven't tried any of the recipes in the book yet, but it's a beautiful book. Um, Tara actually lucked out with an internship with Martha Stewart Living right out of college, and she ended up being senior food editor there, yes. I believe, um, before moving on to the Ladies Home Journal. So Tara has quite the cooking chops behind her. Um, so we will forgive her for deciding to cook a chicken today. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> But no, Tara's, Tara's great, and um, I'm really excited. She is going to cook a chicken and paper. Now, I assume, for those of us who consider chickens pets and not food, um, could we put, could we do fish, or could we use, like, another animal in the paper? Yes, fish is awesome in parchment paper packets. So out of right. my cookbook, like you showed, I am making this chicken and paper. And What page is that? Yeah, it's a steaming uh, situation. So you are a steaming cooking method right here. And it's so quick, I'm gonna jump into it. I actually just cooked okay. a couple. It took 15 minutes, it was so fast. Um, if you're in the cookbook, it's on page 128. Okay, yep. Yay! Yeah. That looks great. so beautiful. So okay, easy. yeah. So the first thing is I'm going to make my parchment packets. And I like to make heart shapes. You can certainly leave it rectangle. But I just have two big sheets of parchment. I am halving the recipe for our demo. But normally you would just cut uh, four of these. And what I'm doing, this takes you back to kids craft days. You are just making the biggest heart shape you can make. So we fold it in half and we cut a half a heart shape. So easy. And then watch this. Both my parchment papers look like a heart. Oh, fun. Did you love that? So mm -hmm. we set those aside. And then the next thing I love is you can put any tender vegetable in these packets. You just want something that will steam, like bok choy or spinach or something like that. But I am doing carrots. Now, carrots aren't tender, so I want to make them tender. So the way that I do that is I'm going to take a vegetable peeler and just peel strips of that carrot. Oh, like carrot ribbon. Yes. So you get these carrot ribbons and they're just thin as can be and they steam in just a few minutes. And I just stick that carrot. Can you see my cutting board? Just right here. Yes. Yeah. Yep. On the cutting board and cut those little ribbons. Look at that, how tender and flimsy they are. So yes, if you're doing fish, I already prepared my chicken, but I have just, uh, chicken breasts are so big, you can cut them in half. I have little like three and a half to four ounce pieces of chicken that will go in each. 
packet and I'll hurry and finish some more of these carrots. But if you do fish, same thing, just a little three ounce piece of fish. And the reason we do it that size is because our parchment isn't huge and that's as much parchment as we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Georgia actually just, uh, she said you could do quail also, quail oh, yes, and paper. Right. Any poultry, you could even do little turkey cutlets if you want. Um, you could also do pork tenderloin, although I mm. kind of like fish and chicken and poultry better. All right, the next thing is we wanna make our, flav our intense flavors. So I mix together herbs and seasonings and garlic and lemon zest. And what we're gonna do is just some chopped parsley, some a zest of one lemon, some minced garlic. And I just, you know, again, I'm halving this, but you would just do two cloves of garlic. I have some red chili flakes. Of course, you can leave that out if you don't want spicy. I have ground coriander, one of my favorite spices. I think ground coriander goes in everything. And then sumac. Hmm. Have you ever cooked with sumac? No, I have not actually. I think I have some and I smelled it and it smelled really interesting. Yes, it's, it's a bit citrusy. I'm just gonna add some salt here. And, but it's, it's just got so many layers of flavor and I really like it. So if you don't have it, you can leave it out because we have lemon zest in the mixture. But if you have sumac, this is a fun recipe to use it in. Perfect. So this, can you see this beautiful parsley mixture? It's so flavorful. And I'm going to put about a tablespoon and a half on my carrots. And then I'm also going to add the rest of my salt and a little bit of honey. <gasps> Do you see how I'm putting salty and sweet together? I love it. <laughs> I love salty and sweet. <laughs> No, I agree. I'm a huge salted caramel type person. Yes, and, and just that little hint, a drizzle of honey is so great. So these carrots get tossed up and they'll just sit there for a minute and absorb all of those flavors. And we have some of that parsley for our chicken in just a second. So the next thing I'm before I get chicken on my board, I'm just going to cut a couple of slices of lemon. Now I love, if, even if you've got fish or quail or whatever, I love putting a slice or two of fresh citrus right in the mm -hmm. packet because as that cooks right you get the intensity of the rind and you get the juice from the middle of that it's so great for anyone who just joined we are making chicken in paper isn't there like a fancy french name for this yes it's called en papillote and okay. if i had a great french accent that would come out sounding <laughs> really nice but i don't so I in paper work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, so if you have your baking sheet, I like to prepare these packets right on the baking sheet because you don't want to really move them around. They're very delicate. But can you see this okay, Lisa? Am I in yep. there? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on one half of the heart, we're gonna start building our packet, our en papillote packet. So I am going to take one piece of chicken. Oh, no, I'm going to put the carrots down first. <laughs> right? We're doing this Yeah, so the carrots fast. are definitely on the bottom. You could put it on top. I mean, let's be honest. Everything's just getting all steamed up and amazing. But that is a nice little bed for our chicken right there. So we've got our veggies on the bottom, and they're full of flavor. So you're not even seasoning the chicken because we have so much flavor on the top and the oh, bottom. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then because we have salt in the carrots and now we have salt in the parsley that's going to go on top. So on top of this chicken, I want to sprinkle some more of that really powerful parsley mixture. And I love this again with the salty sweet. I put a few golden raisins in there. You could use currants. I you love could, that idea. Yes. You could use chopped up apricots, just some lovely mild, um, dried fruit, right? And then, of course, I love to add a few little pine nuts just to get a little crunch, and it goes so well with Yummy. all those flavors. And, of course, we're going to stick our lemon slices right on top. Now, this looks gorgeous as is, but you know what? We're going to make it nice and yummy by steaming it all together. So fold that heart over, and then I like to start from the, the center of the heart and just start folding about half 
inch increments over all around the edge. So you're almost pleating that paper. Now, have you ever done this, Lisa? No, I've not. I'm I do have to... parchment though. I cook on parchment a lot. Yeah, yeah, and it's just so great. And it, I mean, you most likely have it in your kitchen. And like- Easy said, cleanup too, right? Cause I mean, there's no, there's really yeah. nothing to clean except for the baking sheet. So such easy cleanup. And you know what's fun is everyone gets their own little packet. So I call them little presents yeah. on a plate, right? So there is your packet that goes in the oven for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Can you believe it? Wait, so did you pre-cook the chicken, did you say? Or you didn't? Yes. I have my packets right here, so I'm going to show you how to open them. Okay. So I have one here, and I love to serve it this way. So you just put it on the plate, and then I love to snip just a little, maybe like a little X in the top, and that's how everyone gets their food. And then they can tear open their own packet. That's cute. And reveal this gorgeous, amazing dinner. Can you like hold that up so we can see it like close yeah, up? Can hold it up. That's beautiful. Plus it keeps it warm probably. Like if you're waiting for everyone to just kind of get seated and all that, it keeps everything warm. I love this idea. It so if you did fish though, you wouldn't need to pre-cook the fish. You could just no, put the raw fish in probably, right? Don't pre -cook oh. chicken or fish. Oh, okay. It goes in raw. So I have my raw chicken here that goes in. Oh, wow. And okay. because steaming is such high intense heat, it cooks that chicken or that fish in 15 minutes. And wow. At you know, 400, I say. Yep, at 400. And you know what's interesting is that chicken does not get overcooked. It is so juicy, so delicious. And all of those flavors stay in that packet. So you're not losing any of the juices, losing any of the you know, all of that. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it is beautiful. I'm definitely going to try this. I love the pine nut raisin combination. I think that's great. The pine nut raisin, and I'm telling you, if you do fish, try another dried, fit, dried fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you're doing chicken and maybe some more intense flavors like spinach, you could do Cherry. thinly sliced <laughs> dates. Oh, dates. Yeah. <laughs> Love what it. were you asking? No, I said I was going to say you could use dried cherries. Oh, yum. Cranberries, cherries, yes. Whatever flavors you think go, like, complement the savory flavors that are in there. And I also right. love using parsley because it gives that pop of herbs without mm -hmm. overpowering it. You know, you get that herby flavor, but parsley is so mild. I love it. Right. Yeah, because if you use, like, rosemary or thyme or something, you're going to have to pick it out. Like, you're not, not going to yeah. want to... It's going to be too much. In your you certainly could put a sprig of rosemary or thyme over the fish or over because you don't want to eat a whole mouthful. But you right. can also, I'm just going to show you again how tender. You can see those carrots have really gotten cooked and they're soft right. and, you know, sweet and savory. So it's a good one. It's a fun one. And all, like, the whole family loves it because it's this unique way of eating dinner. So, and well, now that you mentioned that, you even could customize, like, if one kid doesn't like the carrots, you could use spinach in one, you could use, you know, you can, you, everybody could make their own custom one, which is great, too. Yes, and it's like that upscale tinfoil dinner. Like, we all love tinfoil <laughs> dinners <laughs> from our childhood. But this way, instead of, like, hamburger or heavy potatoes, we get a lot more versatility with flavor. Right. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you so much, Tara. Bye. Live life deliciously. Go follow Tara Teaspoon. Her real name is Tara Bench. I really thought your real name was Tara Teaspoon. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, who is named Tara Teaspoon? That's awesome. Of course she had to write a cookbook. Well, you um, can call me Tara Teaspoon anytime. So fun. Okay, enjoy. I loved it. Thanks, Tara. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay, I just invited Melissa. Tara needs to go away, though. <laughs> We're watching Tara eat. I know. How do I do this? I don't know. I think you have to, like, stop watching or something and then come back on. Okay, see ya. Bye. All right, let me – whoops. All right, I think I invited uh, Melissa. So our next course is a spring salad 
with Melissa, also known as Lulu the Baker. And she has a new book out that is so new, we don't even have it yet. But it's called Farmhouse Weekends. If you go back to any of our feeds, you can enter to win a set of all the cookbooks. And um, you will get a copy of Farmhouse Weekends. I actually had a review copy. It's beautiful. Um, I really love it. I initially met Melissa, or met, like, you know, virtually met Melissa, um, because she wrote um, – Scandinavian gatherings, which I love. I'm Finnish. I believe she is from Swedish descent, and I always love a good Scandinavian cookbook. So that's how I first started um, following Melissa, and I think I just added her on. We'll see. Yes, there she is, Melissa. Hi. I can't see you yet. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Oh, okay. I, oh, there, there I am now. I can see. Yeah, you were good. Okay. Yeah. So I'm farmhouse so weekend. Oh yes. Beautiful cover. This is like fake book. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, um, I like cooking traditional Scandinavian food. My mom cooked it. My grandmother cooked it. And I found Melissa through her Scandinavian gatherings cookbook and, you know, continued to follow her. But so you have your book, you, yes. you got copies. It's a, a real copy. And, um, I know Lisa has a digital copy. I, I have it going for her. Um, but when you get your book, it'll be on page 24. Um, and it's called The Spinach Avocado and Snap Pea Salad with Raspberry Shallot Vinaigrette. So it's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, and the salad is delicious. I'm so excited to make it with you. Can you see okay? Do I need to adjust the camera? Yeah, no, you're good. Because we like the top of your head cut off a little bit, but we can see all what you're making. So okay. yeah, it's fine. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do, um, we have this nice big salad bowl, um, and we're just gonna add some baby spinach. If you don't like baby spinach, I would say like spring mix would be really good to use. And um, the five ounce package always seems small until you dump it out, and then those mm. greens just multiply. <laughs> so they end up taking up a lot of space. Um, and then we've got all kinds of yummy spring produce. We've got sliced strawberries, um, we've got regular little cherry bell radishes, and then at my grocery store, we have watermelon radishes. So I grabbed some of those too because they're so beautiful. Um, Love those. Got some scallions and some sugar snap peas. And for both of those, I like to cut them on the bias. So um, on, also on the scallions, um, you only want to use like, this part right here for those of you making it if you want to save these dark green parts for like garnish or something that's fine but this is the onion part this part has less flavor so you trim off the ends and then you're going to turn your knife this way and you're going to cut on the diagonal it just makes it look really pretty and fancy and especially fancy if, yeah fancy cutting it does and it's the same amount of work so why not make it look extra fancy and on the sugar snap peas when i first started making this salad i would leave them whole but then I would get a whole bite of just sugar snap pea. It didn't really work with everything else. So I started cutting those on the bias too. And it makes them so pretty because you can see like the edges, you can see a little shape, but then you also get pieces. Let me see if I can find one. You can get pieces. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that we're too far away. Maybe I'll come closer. <laughs> I have this big kitchen island in the way, but you get pieces that have little peas in them too. So it's just really visually that's cute. It makes yeah. the salad look really interesting and cute. All right. Then that's something on, on Top Chef or whatever. They're always saying, you know, if you're making a salad, if you're making whatever, a stew, like the pieces should all be uniform. You yeah. know, you don't want like a big hunk of potato and then like a tiny sliver of carrot. So you want like right. uniformity. Yes. And that way you can have a bite of salad that has all of the flavors in it together. If you leave those sugar snap peas whole, that's a whole mouthful all by itself. So right. you can't fit too much else in there. So we're just going to add those on top. And you can do it much prettier <laughs> at home. I'm just going to dump for now. And then the other thing we need to add to the top is just avocado. Now, if you'll notice in the picture in the book, um, I didn't dice it, even though the recipe says to dice it. And I diced it here because, again, what you were saying, Lisa, you want to have little pieces where you can get a bite of everything together. Um, but, you know, I do kind of like, do you, 
you did like the thin crescent slices I sort did. of. I think that's kind of pretty though. I kind of liked it that. Is. And that's why I did it that way for pictures because it's so pretty to look at and you kind of fan them out. Um, and if you're serving this salad to guests, that is totally up to you. If you want to do the pretty option, they can cut their own avocado chunks when they get their salad. <laughs> if it's too big to fit in their mouth, they can just cut it up. All right. So there's our avocado. Um, now we have a couple of things that are going to go on top of our salad. Um, one, we have these slivered almonds that I sugared really quickly and it's super easy. Oh, it's less than five minutes. So all you do is pop a cup of slivered almonds in a skillet and you add a little bit of sugar. I think it was two tablespoons and then a pinch of salt. Whenever I make something sweet, I always like to add a little bit of salt to really bring out that sweetness. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just cook that over medium heat and you kind of toss it around and stir it just for five minutes until the sugar has melted. And so you can kind of smell it all. Yeah. yeah. You can, they'll start to toast. It'll start to smell really good. You don't want them to get too dark. Um, and then as soon as they're done, I just get a piece of tin foil and I spray it with cooking spray and I pour the almonds onto that so that they don't stick to anything. Um, so they're ready to right. go. You can see they're, they're nice and loose. They're not like, you know, big chunks of toffee or anything like that. So that's going to go on top. And then we have some, I just have some, uh, poppy seeds and sesame seeds. And you can put those on now, or you can put them on, um, if you're going to dress the whole salad, you can put those on after you dress it. Um, if you're going to let people kind of serve it and dress themselves, you can kind of work out when to put that on. It's really flexible. That's one of the things I like about salads is that mm -hmm. you can kind of tailor it to, to whatever your situation is and how pretty you want the presentation to be. And then the last thing we're going to do is make our own dressing. I love making salad dressings. I think they taste so much better than store-bought dressing and they're super easy. And we are gonna use a blender if you have a food processor that works too. Um, so let's see, what are we adding? We've got half a cup of olive oil. So we're gonna put that in. I have, I believe this is half a cup of granulated sugar. It's a really nice sweet dressing. Um, if you don't like super sweet dressings, you can certainly play around with the amount of sugar right. that you add. I really like a lot of sugar. I have a sweet tooth. <laughs> um, we're going to do a pinch of salt. We have a teaspoon of, um, in the recipe, it says finely chopped shallots um, or finely minced shallots. Because we're putting it in the blender, I didn't worry too much about how finely I chopped those because it's going to do that for me. But I chopped it a little so that I don't have big chunks of shallot rattling around in there. We've got some Dijon mustard that kind of helps bind everything together and makes it nice and creamy. And then a teaspoon of paprika. And I'm trying to think, this is a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce. And then this is not yes. going the direction I thought. I thought you were going to do some kind of like honey balsamic, but nope, we're not, we're not doing that. No, it actually, it does end up really sweet because of the sugar, but also the vinegar that we use. We're using a nice sweet vinegar. So the vinegar that okay. I have that I like in this dressing is a raspberry vinegar. Um, it is a mm. little tricky to find. So the one that I have comes in this cute bottle. I think the brand is Kozlowski Farms. Um, sometimes I cannot find this. So I tested it when I was developing the recipe with a nice balsamic. And because balsamic is kind of the same color, mm -hmm. and it kind of has that sweet, fruity taste, it makes a pretty good substitute. So if you can okay. find raspberry vinegar, I would use that. If you can't, balsamic makes a good substitute. And you can find balsamic anywhere. Any grocery yeah. store has balsamic vinegar. So we're going to add that. And then we are just going to blend it up in the blender. So I'm going to do that really quickly. Hopefully it won't be too loud. Okay. I'm really doing a job on this um, charcuterie board here. 
I was hungry though. I was getting everything ready at lunchtime, so I never ate lunch. So it's a good thing that I did have my drink in my board. Okay. And it doesn't take very long. Um, and I've watched plenty of cooking videos and tons and tons of cooking shows. Um, and a lot of times they have you blend everything together and then stream the oil and last. But mm -hmm. I honestly have not found any difference when I just toss everything at the same time and blend it up. Um, all salad dressings that you make at home will separate eventually. Like if I made this ahead of time and I kept it in the fridge. Oh, yeah, of course. You'd have to shake it or something. Yeah, you just give it a little yeah. And it doesn't I mean salad dressing doesn't matter so as much. It's like a hollandaise or a bernays or like a sauce that you need to stay together. So yeah, yeah. And there's our dressing. Oh my gosh, it's sweet. It's tangy. It is so delicious, and it's a really lovely color. So whenever you're ready to serve your salad, you can either put that on the side and people can dress their own, or you can pour it on top, give it a little toss, whatever works best for your dinner or brunch. It's great for brunch. That's a beautiful salad. I love it. I love it too. Love it. All right. So go follow Lula the Baker. Um, look for her new book, Farmhouse Weekends. Scroll back on any of our feeds and you can enter to win all the books. Look for Scandinavian Gatherings because I do love this book too. And um, we are going to make a dessert now. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Bye. Okay, I just invited Jessica from Savory Experiments, and here she is. <laughs> She's going to be making dessert, and if any of you got the ingredients in advance, we had them in a post, you can make it right along with her. I had all the good intentions of actually making an angel food cake this morning and making dessert along with her, but I didn't. So we're just going to let Jessica go at it. Jessica is a photographer, a recipe developer, and she is working on a new cookbook that's coming out next year, which I'm excited about. But she actually is giving away a free online seven-day course to becoming a better home baker. So if you register to win the cookbook giveaway, that course will be included. So that's super exciting because I think all of us have done a lot more cooking this last year. I know most, I have. Most certainly, most certainly. And it's, it's actually to be a better home cook. So it's baking and cooking and everything else. And it's just little tips and tricks to turn any recipe you have. I'm so jealous you have a cocktail. I should have gotten stuff to make myself a cocktail. I don't anymore. It's empty. I need, I'm like <laughs> eyeing my ingredients. I need to make another one. <laughs> I've been sitting here watching you guys and I'm like, I'm so hungry. I need a drink. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's, it, simple tips in your email about how to make and dress up any meal to be a little bit more gourmet and just to take any recipe you have and make it just a little bit more special. So it's, it's really user friendly and versatile. And that's mm -hmm. also what I'm making for you guys today. I'm making a super versatile dessert. So when I'm hosting a dinner party, I like to enjoy myself. I don't want to be stuck in the kitchen and just bringing out platters and serving people. And generally, by the time we get to dessert, I've had several beverages myself. So <laughs> I, it needs to be easy and even better bonus points if it's a uh, kind of like a dessert bar, like make your own. So that's fun um, too. Yeah, it, it is. And kids love it. I have two small mm -hmm. kids, so they, they love it as well. And adults do too. So I'm going to make strawberry angel food parfaits. And if we're being completely honest, part of what I do is cut corners here and there because we're all busy. And I did not bake my own angel food cake. I totally picked one up at the store. I, you know, so. and so I didn't even know, like, I, I mean, I didn't know that you could actually buy an angel food cake at the store. I don't spend a lot of time in the bakery at the girl, you know, because I do bake a yeah. lot, but yeah, I had no idea that you could actually buy a ready-made angel food cake. That's awesome. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Go ahead and buy it at the store. And the thing that I do make from scratch here is the strawberry topping. It's super easy. So I'm going to show you how to make that real quick. And then I'll show you how to assemble the, the um, actual parfait. So I went ahead Perfect. and chopped up some strawberries here. It's a coarse chop. We're going to add about half of them. This is two cups. It's about a, a little bit less than one pound if you're buying a container at the store. I then put in about a quarter of a cup of water. It, this is such a forgiving recipe. So if you do a little bit less or a little bit more, you really don't need to worry about that. Half a cup of sugar, and I'm eyeballing this now because I apparently set my cup, my measuring cups down in the location. <laughs> and 
One tablespoon of cornstarch. The cornstarch is going to thicken up the natural sauces. And um, so I have a burner actually here, but magic of television, I have some already prepared. Imagine that. So if you yeah. don't have strawberries, you could use blueberries or raspberries or pretty much any kind of berry. Raspberries, any kind of berry. The cornstarch is going to thicken up the natural juices in it, and it's also going to make it pretty and glossy. If you do it without oh, cornstarch, you can cook it for, friend. yeah, you can do it without cornstarch, or you could also use arrowroot if you wanted to, but it's going to cook down, and you could do it without, but it'll take a closer to 45 minutes to get to that same consistency, and it still won't have that glossiness that you get from adding cornstarch. Yep. So the I other thing- I did not know that. The, yeah, it, it's the same as teriyaki sauce and stuff like that. That's what gets it the glossy flavor. So the other secret here is citrus. Um, like we were talking about in so many of the other recipes, it really brightens up the flavors and adds the little bit of bang. And it doesn't have to be citrus. You can also use any kind of acid. So a balsamic vinegar, an apple cider vinegar, even a splash of wine if you don't have um, lemon juice or or vinegar on hand. It's going to cook hmm. long enough that all of the alcohol will cook out of it. So you don't need to be concerned about it being an alcoholic strawberry sauce. Although if you are going in that direction, that, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no judgment if this is a, a, an adult only dinner party. After the sauce is cooked, you can throw in a tablespoon of bourbon or whiskey or a flavored liqueur and no one will judge you. Um, yeah, like Chambord or something like that would yes. be beautiful. Or even even a Cointreau that I have out from my that cocktail. Would be great. That would be great. That would be great. And, of course, uh, a little dash of salt because we've been talking about salty and sweet, and I am a total sucker for anything salty and sweet as well. It also brightens the rest of the flavors. Salt accentuates sweet. So it's perfect in almost every dessert. And you see it in all your baked stuff. I, I People are exactly. like, salt? And I'm like, yes. You put it in cakes and cupcakes and frostings. Why wouldn't you put it in your strawberries? I I honestly think I put salt in like everything I cook. I mean, I, I don't know that there's a recipe that like if it doesn't ask for salt, I'm like, wait, there's no salt in this. But then I add some. I right. Lisa, I have a travel tin of salt, Maldon sea salt in my purse. And I have no shame. I will be at a restaurant and be like, this is not properly seasoned. And That's seasoned fun. Myself. And, you know, a lot of restaurants, they don't even put salt and pepper on the table because the chef you know, feels that they season the dish, you know, and, and that, yep. that does bug me. I have to say, if I'm eating out with people, I've, I've trained my husband, but it bugs me if someone salts their food without tasting it, you know, like I, they I automatically totally sit down and they, they sit, they sit down, they look at their plate and they throw salt all over it, like taste it first and then salt I it if you need agree. it, you I know, totally but, agree with you. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So let this boil down and then we're going to, it only takes three, three to five minutes. It's not a quick, it's not a, a fast sauce. Yeah. It's really simple. And then I add the rest of the strawberries. The reason that I do this is that I want a, I want difference in texture. I want the right. strawberries I'm adding last to have a little bit of toothiness and still be juicy, but the other ones are going to be more of that saucy, mashy texture. And that gives it some textural variety, even though it's a really simple sauce. Okay, so I'm going to move this burner. Hindsight, I probably didn't need to do the whole burner setup here, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, but my kitchen is under construction, so I'm actually borrowing a friend's kitchen today. Well, it's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> I know, right? Like, you couldn't ask for a better better setup <laughs> for a borrowed kitchen. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but here I am hauling all my stuff over here. Okay, so I like to use, you can use parfait or pudding cups, but wine glasses, Stemless or with stems are perfect. Martini cups are great too. I am going to take this angel food cake, about a slice per cup. You could also do pound cake or any kind of sponge okay. cake that you wanted to use. And just dice it. I'm realizing my camera doesn't get that low. Um, into I know the square, the square is tough. It's like a tough angle. It is. And I, ch I checked the positioning before we went on, but it, you know, then you've got your big rectangle. So I'm just going to take these, these, diced up pieces of angel food cake and pour some magic of television strawberry sauce <laughs> right over the top and layer it. This is it in its most simplistic form is just strawberries, angel food, strawberries, angel food, and then whipped cream on top. But nice. we're gonna get fancy here. But wait, there's more. I've got <laughs> sweetened coconut flakes, mini chocolate oh. chips, candied walnuts, and salted caramel on here. 
So you can put this all on your little parfait bar and go ahead and let people build their own. I personally Fun. really like it with candied walnuts and a little bit of caramel sauce. So that's what I'm going to do in mine. This is a homemade salted caramel sauce too. You just felt like a bazillion hearts when you mentioned salted caramel sauce. <laughs> If I just, you know what, my cookbook coming out is all beef. I should just do like a salted caramel cookbook. That would be excellent. Right. Um, yeah. So I got to finish dicing up this, this uh, angel food cake, do another thing of strawberries. You could even do fresh strawberries too, or even more fresh fruit if you wanted to get that fresh element in there. Okay. So again, I'm all about cutting corners and I don't have a kitchen right now. So I totally picked up a spray can of excellent whipped cream. <laughs> <laughs> which my kids will love. My son is almost two and he'll walk up to me and go okay. <laughs> right on top. And there you go. These are really pretty. If you're using this kind of whipped cream, it's stabilized. So you, if you want to make them ahead of time and don't do the whole yeah. bar thing, you can make them ahead of time, throw them in the fridge. I love an individual dessert at dinner parties. I think it just makes it so much warmer and more fun and easier than having to serve out a cake and slice yeah like a pie and it doesn't yeah plus I mean I don't like sharing so I am all about like having my own yep. <laughs> whether it's like my meal or my dessert like just give me my own I don't want to have to share totally totally <laughs> so there you go it's easy it's ready to go and it's it's delicious it has texture it has flavor and it's fun and I love that I'm gonna have to go look for for angel food cake at the grocery store now because I am just like I have no idea you can no totally make all. your own, make your own if you wanted to, but um, <laughs> that and pound cake. I do some, you know, pound cakes where you just kind of slice them and dice them and fill them yourself, but it's, mm -hmm. it's total time saving hack if you don't have time to do your own. Yeah. I mean, I, I have brownie mix. I, I always, I buy the Giardelli boxed brownie mix because like who wants to mix up their own brownies? It's just easier to use the box and they come out great. So I yeah, agree. I'm all about, I'm all about uh, doing it more often and using shortcuts so you can do it more often. Certainly, certainly. Awesome. This was so great. And like I said, if you sign up for the cookbook giveaway, any of our feeds has the entry form and you just um, comment, you tag a few friends and you'll win a seven day course to being a better cook. And plus all the cookbooks and there's one other thing I was going to say. I don't remember. Oh, yeah. And look for her cookbook. We're probably going to do something else together because our cookbooks should be coming about out about the same time. And yeah. um so, you know, just keep following savory experiments. Make sure you follow all of the co-hosts. And we didn't get very many questions. I hope people were just paying attention because we didn't get very many questions at all. But that's okay. That's all right. And we're going to save this so everybody will have it on their IGTV. So if you missed the beginning, you can go back and watch the whole thing. Excellent. Thank you for having me. There you go. Thanks. Have See you everybody day. later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.